consumption, five and a half over a day, red meat, any kind of red meat, and mortality. But the first thing you do when you do these studies, having done a number of clinical trials myself, is you have to do a correction for error measurement. Your data, the raw data is not valid. The first thing you do is you correct it, and then you start looking at your results. And once they corrected for measurement error, what they found was there was no association between the consumption of red meat and total mortality, heart attacks, cardiovascular disease, cancer at any level of consumption. Wow. H- however, when they looked at processed meats, yeah. there was a clear association between heart attacks, cancer, and total mortality at, at every level, especially pronounced at the higher levels. So what we see is it's not the red meat, but it's the processing. Mm. And in fact, this is an agreement with another study that was done about two, three years ago out of Harvard, where they looked at in a fashion called a meta-analysis, where they pool a lot of smaller studies. Right. So the total number was over a million worldwide. And what they found was when they looked at fresh red meat, no association with heart disease, no association with the development of diabetes. But if you ate just two ounces of processed food, pr- processed red meat, so that's that, that eat fresh sandwich, you know, yeah. if you guys have that chain up there, two ounces a day, you increase your risk of heart disease by over 40% and your risk of developing diabetes by almost 20%. What about these uh, these GMO foods that that we're hearing so much about genetically modified organ organisms? Um, how are they affecting the human body? You know that's a great question because we have no idea. Wow! Because they're so new. But I've got to tell you, you know, when we look at the manipulation mm-hmm. at the genetic level, there's just something kind of unholy to me. You know, evolution is and and. Um, the development and natural mutation is a part of life on Earth. You know, a, an apple tree, you know, may produce slightly sweeter apples and the animals like them. And then, you know, that kind of tree mm-hmm. comes to prominence, the one that produces delicious sweet apples. But you don't see, you know, an apple tree growing eyeballs. You know, it, well, you know not so yet anyway. <laughs> not, well, yeah, very, very good point. <laughs> But, you know, when you're taking a uh, slice of mm-hmm. DNA that, to produce something that, you know, is completely foreign to that animal or, or plant, mm-hmm. um, we, have, we have absolutely no idea how that's going to play out. You know, especially when you're taking, you know, you know bacterial-resistant um, parts, uh, for example, you know, they're taking these GMO crops and they're putting the resistant gene to, for example, the Roundup chemicals uh, in that plant so that you can spray the hose the field down with Roundup, for example, mm-hmm. um, or something like that, kill everything but this you know, particular plant. It doesn't mean that this pesticide doesn't accumulate in there. It doesn't mean that there's not going to be a mutation. We just have no idea. So for my part, personally, um, although there's very little data out there because we just don't know, I stay, try to stay away from all GMOs. It scares the hell out of me when you buy a watermelon that has no seeds. Like, what is going on here? <laughs> you know, like, I, I'm sorry. You know, I'm from the old school where food was fresh. Food was real. You know, I often wonder what tastes better, the packaging or the food? Well, you know, what's amazing is in some of these drive through places, mm-hmm. the packaging costs more than the food. And I'll, and I'll bet you the packaging is better to eat than the food. <laughs> At least you get some dietary fiber. <laughs> exactly. Exactly. Um, it seems, Doctor, that as we're progressing into the future, more and more is coming to, is coming to light. For example, the number of people who are being diagnosed with Meniere's disease now it's just skyrocketing. Multiple sclerosis, skyrocketing. Um, and other diseases that were heard about once in a blue moon now seem to be common. Yes, and these, these are diseases, um, and I talk about this, and the, the book covers it in great detail, mm-hmm. the upcoming book, The Fallacy of the Calorie. But, but you've hit on a key. One is that if we looked be pre-industrial revolution, yeah. we hardly see a mention of these diseases. And one of the kickers 
is that if we then look at isolated but contemporary indigenous cultures, so, you know, small tribe of maybe hunter-gatherers right. or, or people where their food pathways are essentially isolated from uh, the modern Western diet, we don't see these diseases either. So it's clearly not something that is simply affecting humanity as we're going forward. It affects humanity that participates in the modern Western diet. And my thought on that is that, you know, people will argue, but uh, to what extent? But I think everyone would agree that, you know, there's certain extremes where people are born with congenital anomalies, mm -hmm. and diet really doesn't have anything to do with it. You know, you're born with uh, an atrial septal defect in your heart, and it doesn't matter what you eat, it ain't going to get fixed. Likewise, if you buy a vacation home at Chernobyl, it doesn't matter what you eat. You know, if you're living in radiation, that environment is going to be toxic. Um, but in between, for most of us, the expression of these chronic diseases of civilization uh -huh. is a result of our genetics, you know, how that interplays with our environment. Mm -hmm. And there's no more intimate and daily expression of that action than what happens in our gut and the involvement of our gut microbiome. Most people don't realize that your gut has, we estimate, about 100 trillion bacteria. That's 10 times more bacterial DNA in you and bacterial cells in you than are your own cells. You are mostly not you. We're mostly bacteria. We're mostly bacteria. We're you know upwards of 90% yeah. bacterial cells if we just count cells, which – Every time I say that, I step back and it kind of blows my mind a little bit. Anyway, I, I, I'm still back on that thing about buying a summer home in Chernobyl. <laughs> <laughs> you know, the, the, your home will glow in the dark. I don't know. And then a hundred. And you will too. Yeah, but, exactly. but think of what you'll save on lighting. <laughs> That'll put Ontario Hydro out of job, won't it? Um, <laughs> what about all these overweight children? Is is what do we do about this? It's it's a crisis. It's an epidemic. Well, it it is, and and it's interesting because you know, obviously, the amount that we consume mm -hmm. has something to do with it, but that's only part of the equation. Um, we become more and more sedentary, so and we're losing the benefits of regular physical exercise, especially for our young people. Big time, yeah. and that's incredible. Big big time, yeah. and that's incredibly important. But there's other things that affect obesity that most people don't realize. Um, something as simple as sleep. You know, the amount of sleep you get or lack thereof can be as important in the development of obesity mm -hmm. as how many calories you eat each day. So, so do people with weight problems sleep more? Or do they sleep less? No, actually, it's disrupted sleep. It's ah. a lack of, you know, the, the quality sleep. Right. We see that that lack of sleep is associated, again, with a lot of these other uh, diseases of modern civilization, mm -hmm. with, card with having increased risk of cardiovascular disease, so on and so forth. And it has to do with the fact that, you know, we don't get to reset our brains. We don't get to reset our hormonal balance. So we become out of balance. You combine that as you said, with a lot of the garbage people take in and the, the complexion of our gut microbiome mm -hmm. uh, can contribute significantly to the development of obesity, irrespective, really, of um, you know, what we eat. And I'll give you an example. Uh, this was actually published in Nature. It was a fascinating study that they did on mice. And, and you know, with the caveat that obviously mice are not people. Sure. But they took the these mice whose guts were sterile, and they gave them basically the bacteria from sets of twins. One was a, a an obese twin, one was a, a normal weight or thin twin, mm -hmm. and then they fed the mice. And the uh, mice that came from the obese twin became obese, even though the mice were eating the same thing. The thin mice stayed thin. Now here's the here's the really fascinating part. It gets even better. So mice have this nasty habit of liking to eat each other's feces. So they put all the mice together in a cage. Right. So now all of these were mixed up, and the fat mice became thin, huh. all eating the same food, all eating the same amount of calories. That's Simply better. an effect of the gut microbiome. Huh. Something else that, uh, that I was reading the other day in a, in a magazine is that the, there seems to be an increase in thyroid disorders. More and more, yeah, it, hypo, what's it called? Hypothyroid, 
hypothyroid? Uh, hypo- hypothyroidism. Yes, and, that's it. Um, we can see autoimmune mm-hmm. um, conditions like Hashimoto's uh, thyroiditis, which is an acute thyroiditis, and then it goes on to cause a hypothyroid condition when it burns out. Right. And this goes back to what we're seeing in terms of these uh, diseases of modern civilization, these autoimmune diseases that all, again, have as their root this ongoing chronic low-level inflammation that really, I believe, starts in the gut. And of course, you know, when we're looking at, at society, we're looking at bad food, we're looking at lack of exercise, kids would rather, and I think parents would rather have their kids sit down in front of, the, in front of a computer or play with the Xbox than go outside. God, when I was a kid, hey, you were outside, you know, it's raining, wear a raincoat, it's snowing, what? wear your snowsuit. <laughs> That's exactly right. You know, I guess part of it is that I was not a great kid. And, you know, uh-huh. really, in retrospect, my mother was a total saint. But I think part of her survival mechanism was I basically got thrown out of the house. It's like, you know, I don't care, you know, if there's a tornado warning. Yep. Kid, you need to get out for about Ex- 15 minutes. Exactly. And at, when I was a kid after supper, we, we, we lived on in the country. So dad put a baseball diamond in our backyard. After I feel the s- dreams. Yeah, well, no, it was it was Mum's way of getting us out of the house. Uh, <laughs> her field of dreams. <laughs> yeah, her field of dreams, right? But you know, Dad would come out after supper, and all the kids from the neighborhoods and, and their and the neighborhood, and their moms and dads would come over, and we'd have games of baseball. We'd go tobogganing in the winter, skiing in the winter. You know, there was always something to do. And I'll tell you, when I was a kid, I was as skinny as a rake. Uh, you 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 are spot on. You know, it's it's not just for. Um, weight maintenance yep. that physical exercise is so important hey doc I it's hate to, so I hate to do this but I, I've got to take my break please stand by Dr. Okay. Michael Fenster is our very special guest www.whatscookingwithdoc.com don't go away with each new extreme weather event or terrorist act it becomes increasingly obvious that we live in uncertain and challenging times we all buy car insurance Why not collapse and catastrophe insurance? Matthew Stein, an MIT-trained engineer and green builder, has written two outstanding books to help people prepare, plan for, and deal with everything from minor situations lasting a few days to full-on collapse. Matt's first book, When Technology Fails, is a manual for self-reliance, sustainable living, and surviving the long emergency. This massive book covers the gamut from first aid and emergency preparedness to alternative healing, renewable energy, primitive living skills, and 18th century technologies that could be critical to your comfort and survival in a long-lasting crisis. Matt's second book, When Disaster Strikes, is a comprehensive emergency preparedness handbook and survival guide. When Disaster Strikes is an essential item for every family's go bag. Both books are available at all usual sources. There's a wealth of totally free information posted at whentechfails.com and author signed copies may be purchased at mattstein.com. That's www.wentechfails.com and www.mattstein.com. Rob McConnell here, presenting an overview for Nicholas Paul Jinnix, author of a fascinating book, Amen. It presents facts revealed by Egyptologists, facts that enable us to understand why Amen is the beginning of creation of God. It provides recommendations for religious leaders of the major religions to unify their beliefs and teach the word of God, love one another. Amen informs people how mankind conceived God, It was the Egyptians that developed the concepts of a soul, a hereafter, and son of God. And finally, after the worship of many gods, they conceived the belief in one universal God, the maker of all there is. For more information, visit www.futureofgodamen.com. That's www.futureofgodamen.com. Exonation, uh, Dr. Michael Fenster has been my very special guest this hour, and we're going to have to have the good doctor on again because his message is very important. And 
As you know, ExoNation, by now, after listening to me blab for 22 years, it's people helping people that is very important in this world today. 